We welcome you. We're glad that you are here at the Royal City Church of Christ to praise God, to worship Him, to study His Word, and to express our love and gratitude to Him for all the things that He has done for us. We are glad that you have assembled together with us, especially if you're visiting with us. If you are a member of the Church of Christ and you're looking for a good congregation to place membership with, I would highly recommend the Roy City Church of Christ as a congregation that is growing spiritually, we're growing numerically, we're doing great things in this community and throughout the world. And if you want to be a part of this great work, please talk to us and we will talk to you and we will uh, work together to serve the Lord here in this area. Some of the greatest teachings of the New Testament are found at the end of the epistles. Oftentimes, when we read or study a book, sometimes, and I'm guilty of this myself, we might gloss over or hurry over the last few verses of a book to finish up that study. However, there are some powerful words at the conclusion of the epistles that teach us so many great things about God and about Christ, about the salvation that He has provided, about the church, and about the spiritual relationship that we have in Christ Jesus. And sometimes we neglect these end passages. However, they are there for a reason And they teach some great things. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27, you have three very powerful verses that we're going to study this morning. As we look, and we're going to do this from time to time, look at the end of the epistles to find the great truths that are sometimes neglected. But they are there and we need to study and contemplate them. This portion of scripture is what people call a doxology. That simply means it is a portion of scripture that praises God. The word doxology comes from the Greek word doxe, which means to glorify, to glory, to praise. Therefore, it is a doxology, a praising of God. And you find that throughout the New Testament epistles. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Those are some powerful words at the conclusion of this great epistle. You have to understand that Paul was writing to the Christians at Rome, the Lord's church in the city, the capital city of the Roman Empire. And he was writing to them in this great book, of the book of Romans, to teach them that Men are justified by faith in Jesus Christ and that faith expresses itself in obedience. It's justification through obedient faith. That is the overall theme of the book of Romans in which he talks about the problem of sin, the solution found in Jesus Christ And that how God had a nation in which he had that nation for a purpose, the nation of Israel, to bring Israel to its Redeemer, to its Messiah, Jesus Christ. That way all people, whether Jewish or non-Jewish, can be saved through Jesus Christ. Romans 16, verses 25 through 27, what Paul does in concluding this book is basically give a summation of the entire book of Romans. He's summarizing it in so many words. Of course, it is the Holy Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul that is actually the ultimate author. Let's break this passage of Scripture down phrase by phrase and look at the great truths that are found in these three verses. Now to him 
who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. The word established here means to render constant, to confirm one's mind. To him, the him there in most translations, you have the H capitalized, is of course referencing God. To God who is able to establish or to render constant according to the gospel. We can have a constant life or we can have a life that is confirmed in the will of God through God. And we're going to see how in just a moment. We are a people who are to be established in God's will because it's been revealed to us. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, as Paul begins the book of Romans, he says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it, the gospel of Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we are established in the salvation that God has provided in His Son Jesus Christ and it's according, Paul said, to my gospel. The gospel that he was preaching is the gospel that he said at the beginning of the book he was not ashamed of. And neither should we. We should not be embarrassed. We should not be ashamed of Jesus Christ and His gospel because it's the only power to save people. As a result of that, we need to not be ashamed of preaching and proclaiming that gospel. And that gospel is what establishes people in a right relationship with God. They are rendered constant. Their minds are confirmed in the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. Now the word gospel simply means good news or good message. It's not really what you would call a religious word. A lot of the words of the New Testament were common words, but yet they have a spiritual significance when it relates to God and to Jesus Christ. The word gospel simply means a good message, good news. And you would have someone that would go forth and would herald forth good news and that person was a herald or a preacher of a good message to the people. It could be a good news about something in society or and in this case, the greatest news of all, salvation from sin and a hope of heaven. That's the greatest news of all. And Paul says in Romans chapter 1, he is not ashamed of it because in it the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, the way man is made right with God is revealed. All of us want to be right with God. We wouldn't be here this morning if we didn't care about being right with God. Those who are spiritual want to be right with God. And so we understand that it's in this good news, the gospel, that we are established in that right relationship with God. And he says it's from faith to faith. It begins with faith, the faith that is revealed in the New Testament, and it ends in our faith doing what God's Word says. The just shall live by faith. The Gospel is this, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. It is the story of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and how that He was seen by over 500 witnesses after His resurrection. He died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and he was resurrected the third day according to the scripture. That is the gospel. That is the good news. That gospel is proclaimed through preaching. As it says in the passage that we're looking at, he establishes us according to the gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. That's how this message is proclaimed. Through preaching, we must convey this message through the proclamation and the preaching of the word. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15. Paul talks about how important it is to send preachers out to support gospel preachers in their effort to preach. 
Romans 10, verses 14 through 15. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Talking about those who hear the gospel. How are they going to call on him, obey the gospel, if they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? Unless they are sent forth. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Who bring glad tidings of good things. The good things you find in the gospel. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. In Him we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Those are the good things that we find in the gospel. But people have got to hear that gospel. So they can know their spiritual condition. That they're lost. And they're without hope. However, the gospel gives them hope. We need to be spreading this word. We need to be supporting the preaching of the gospel, not only here in this community, but throughout the world as we support those who are evangelists throughout the world. You know, when we preach the gospel, we're preaching Jesus Christ. We know what's involved in preaching Jesus Christ because of the book of Acts. We see the church carrying out that great commission of preaching the gospel. Acts chapter 8 and verses 5 and 12, you find something interesting. What all is involved in preaching Jesus Christ? Acts chapter 8 and verse 5, you see Philip went down to the city of Samaria and he preached Christ to them. Now, we have to understand what, what all is involved in preaching Christ. When you look at verse 12, you see what's involved. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. That's preaching the gospel. That's preaching Jesus Christ. He went down and he preached Jesus Christ. And when he preached that, he preached the kingdom of God. That's the church of Christ. He preached the name of Jesus Christ. That's his authority. And he preached the plan of salvation. They were baptized, both men and women. They were immersed. And so in, as we see in Romans chapter 16, we see in this passage of Scripture, we are established according to this gospel, and it's according to the preaching of Jesus Christ. We need to be about doing that, preaching that gospel. Now back to our text in Romans 16. According to the revelation of the mystery kept secret, since the world began, but now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures, made known to all nations. He says this gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is according to revelation. We would not know God's will were it not for revelation. That word revelation simply means an unveiling. Unveiling. And this revelation has been given to us in the written word. It was kept secret since the world began. People want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. People want to be a part of something of significance. If we understand the, the scheme of redemption and we understand the plan of salvation and we understand that being a part of the Lord's church, we're part of something that was in the mind of God before he created the world. That's pretty significant. That's something much bigger than ourself that we can be a part of. And this mystery has been revealed. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We understand what that mystery is. The word mystery in our language sometimes has the concept of something you just can't figure out. It's a mystery. However, in the New Testament, it refers to something that was once hidden, but has now been revealed. It's no longer a mystery. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, as Paul writes to the Lord's church at Ephesus, he says this, For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, 
how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery. Made known to him the mystery by revelation, as I have written already, by which, verse 4, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. We can understand what Paul wrote, he is saying. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his apostles, his holy apostles and prophets. What's the mystery? Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promises in Christ through the gospel. That the Gentiles, those who are not physically descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which in, would include me and probably most of everyone here. Those who are not physically Hebrew, those who are not physical Jews, may have fellowship in the same body. The body there refers to the church. You read of Ephesians chapter 1, you find that out. That they may be fellow heirs together, and that means we're going to inherit the same thing they're going to inherit. Eternal life, salvation, being with God for eternity in heaven, a resurrected body that is glorified and immortal. That is the inheritance that we have. And we are fellow heirs together in the same church. Not in different churches, but in the same church. And we partake of the same promises in Christ Jesus. Because all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And that's through the gospel. That's good news. That's a good message. It has been a secret in times past. In the Old Testament, it wasn't fully revealed. But it has now been revealed in the New Testament. And Paul says, when you read, you may understand my knowledge in that mystery. As I said before, this is something that has been hidden, but is a part of God's scheme of things even, if, even before this planet was created. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. God, in His foreknowledge, foreordained Christ to come into the world. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. Christ indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Before the foundation of the world, it was foreordained that Christ would come into the world and die for me. And for you. Now based on that knowledge. Doesn't that make you feel special? Doesn't that make you feel like you're part of something significant? Knowing that. It does me. Is that not exciting? Should that not feel as full of zeal? To serve the Lord? Do you see why now? Paul is praising God in this passage of scripture. This was something that was planned before this earth was ever created thousands of years ago. And now it's been manifest. That word manifest means to be made known. It's now made known in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9, Paul says, God has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to His own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Before time began, this was a part of God's plan to save me, to save you, to call us by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, we are called by that gospel message. It is a holy calling, not according to how good we are. He didn't call us and say, well, look at how good he is. I'm going to call him to be a Christian. But because we were unclean, we were sinful, we needed salvation according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. That has been made known. It has been revealed. 
it is now made manifest by the prophetic scriptures to all nations. The scriptures he refers to. That word refers to the writings. The original word is graphe. We get the word graphics from it. The writings, the holy writings, the prophetic scriptures are powerful. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Paul tells us how powerful a message this is. This is not just a religious book. This is the power of God. 2 Thessalonians, or excuse me, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture, all the writings are given by the inspiration of God. They are God breathed and are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. By the scriptures, by the writings, I know what to believe. That is correct. I am reproved by the writings. You don't behave that way. That's incorrect. I am corrected by them. I'm placed back on the right path. I have instructions in what is right, righteousness, that the man or the woman of God may be complete, perfect, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I know everything I need to know through the Scriptures. It has been revealed to all nations. Back to Romans chapter 16. It's been made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. This is according to the commandment of the everlasting God. The commandment was to take this message to all nations. Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20, Jesus came and spoke to them before he ascended back to the Father. He says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is the command, the commandment of the everlasting God to take this gospel, to preach it, to proclaim it, and to live it before the lost world. And he says, you go and you make disciples of all nations. It's God's will that we spread this gospel so that they might have an obedience to the faith. The Bible makes it very clear and the book of Romans makes it very clear that the faith that pleases God is a faith that obeys God. And remember what we said at the very beginning, we can be constant, we can be established in that gospel if we have a faith that obeys the will of God. He starts off the book by talking about a faith that obeys. Romans chapter 1 and verse 5. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among all nations. You see how it's not localized. It's for everybody. The gospel is to be spread to all nations. And that faith is a faith that is active, it is living, it is one that submits to the will of God and obeys the will of God, as Paul says in Galatians 5 and verse 6, uh, whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, that avails nothing but faith working through love. Not faith only, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, but faith working, and it's working through love. That's obedience to the faith. And as he ends the book and ends this passage of Scripture, Paul says, To God alone wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. This section of the Scripture, as I said at the beginning of the lesson, is called a doxology because of the word glory, doxae. Glory, to glorify God, to praise Him, to magnify Him. That's the reason why we're here this morning. To worship Him in spirit and in truth, to glorify Him. But not only that, we're to do that on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. 
as we live our life to the glory of God, as we live in obedient faith to the Lord every day of our life. And as Paul wraps up this book, he says to God, God is the originator. He's the originator of creation and he is the originator of redemption who alone is wise. Only God could come up with this wonderful scheme of redemption. Only God. He is the one that's praised for his wisdom. Psalm 29 and verse 2, the psalmist says, Give unto the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. We worship and we praise him. And we're thankful to him for the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. We have to understand that this glory to God is through Jesus Christ and it's forever. And it's made known in the church. Remember I said it's important for humans to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And if you're a member of the church of Christ, you're part of something that is an institution that was planned before the foundation of the world that is the body of Christ. And in that institution, we praise and glorify God. That's how God, through Jesus Christ, is glorified on earth, in His church. Not in a particular country, but in His church, the spiritual body. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Paul, the same author, says this, Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, verse 21, to Him be glory, in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So when a person is a member of this institution, we are a part of the church, the body of Christ. It's in this church that we live and we function. And as we're doing this, as we work and we worship, we are bringing glory to Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, we bring glory to God. Ultimately, there is no such thing as serving Christ outside of his church. This is not referring to a man-made institution. This certainly is not referring to a denomination. It's referring to God's church, the church of Christ. We must understand that all that is done that praises and glorifies God must be done in his church. To Him be glory in the church through Jesus Christ. And notice how it's to every generation till the end of time. How is that possible? We teach them. We preach. We teach and we preach. We teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you, as Jesus said before He ascended. That's how every generation knows the will of God in this society and throughout the world. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 through 27 is a powerful passage of Scripture that says so much. Sometimes these passages at the end of the epistles are overlooked. Let's take time to read them and study them and contemplate them. If there's anyone here this morning who is not a Christian, by God's grace, mercy, and compassion, you have another opportunity to render obedience to the gospel so you too can be a part of this significant institution so that you can be a part of this eternal plan of God. Believe in Christ with all your heart. Have faith in Him. Confess that faith that He is the Son of God. Be willing to repent of your sins. Repentance is sorrow for sin that, that causes you to want to turn away from it and turn towards God. If you've done that and you're ready to be baptized, we can baptize you into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the Lord will add you to His church. Acts 2 and verse 38. Acts 2 and verse 47. If you've done that, you've gone astray. Repent. Come back to Him. As always, the choice is yours. While we stand. While we sing.